So, uh, hello everyone. Uh, I think it's 3.30 p.m. Central European time at least. And I think it's time to start this uh, IPC first global webinar uh, today. Uh, we have participants registered from what I've heard recently is 49 countries. So we have participants from all over the world. And it's probably appropriate for me to say good morning, good afternoon and good evening, depending on what time zones you are in. Um, my name is Lars Iversen. I'm a dermatologist from Aarhus University Hospital in Denmark, and uh, I'm going to chair this first uh, webinar hosted by the IPC. And before we jump to the presentations, I just want to introduce briefly the IPC. I know that there are a lot of participants that are very familiar with uh, the IPC, the International Psoriasis Council. But I also see from the names that are registered that there are maybe someone who's less familiar with the organization. So for those of you who are not so familiar, I want to explain a little bit about the IPC. And the IPC was founded in 2004. Uh, it is a dermatologist-led voluntary global nonprofit organization with a network of more than, actually more than 120 psoriasis expert, thought leaders and professionals who are all dedicated to improving the patient's care around the globe. And we have many activities and the picture to your right now shows some of the, one of the activities that we have had in the last year. We have of course been affected by the pandemic like everyone else in this world. And therefore a lot of our activities has been virtual like the one that we have today. Our vision in the IPC, it is a world free of psoriasis. That's of course, difficult, but this is the vision. And we believe that psoriasis patient and that no matter where they live in the world uh, should have the best available care to them uh, in their particular uh, situation. So this is our vision. And our mission is to improve the care of people with psoriasis worldwide. And that's going to happen through various activities like research, education and advocacy. The global network of psoriasis experts consists actually by May 2021 of 126 board members and counselors. And we are represented by uh, 36 countries. And it is believed that all IPC board members as well as counselors volunteer their time. There's no payment, of course. Is they volunteer their time to implement all IPC programs and activities. And that is actually hold true because on an annual basis, 95% of all participants, all counselors, board members participate in IPC activities. Uh, so you are not only an IPC member, you are an, uh, an active IPC member if you are a counselor or a board member. We have a number of key areas of focus in the organization and I cannot go into any details, of course, because in the interest of time today, but we have focus on access to care and we have several different activities within this field and you can learn more about that on our web page, which I strongly encourage those of you who are not so familiar with our web page to visit because you can learn much more about the activities that, that is going on we also have activities in research. And for example, as one example, we publish best evidence review papers. And the first paper that was actually published rather recently was in fact on biomarkers, which are extremely relevant for today's topic on this webinar. But we also have other activities and again, look at the webpage to learn more about that. We do a lot of medical education and this webinar is of course one such example, but we do also participate in congresses, symposia and webinars all over the world. Uh, we have regional masterclasses where we try to address also more regional specific uh, problems and questions related to psoriasis. We have an international fellowship program. And then we, again, coming back to our website, we have an IPC website knowledge center where you on an individual basis can uh, gain medical education. 
And then, of course, we have a global outreach and we consistently try to expand our reach within the various specific regions of the world. On this page, you can see our web address where you can visit all the activities or read more about the activities that we are, we are hosting. Uh, just a few examples. We have a Take 10 video series where key opinion leaders, global psoriasis experts, addresses a specific question within their, their area of expertise. And this is usually a 10 minute uh, video where you can learn very or very focused uh, presentations on, on, on specific issues of psoriasis. We have on-demand symposia. We have a video library and much more that you can read about on, on the web page. So I strongly encourage you to, to go to this website and learn more about our organization. And then of course we have what we are hosting today, which is the first time we are having a global webinar series. And the series is, this is the first webinar in a series of five, and this is going to run for the next year or so. And you can see that the second webinar is planned for October this year. And then we have three webinars planned for, uh, for next year. This first uh, webinar that, that we have today is on, as you probably know, all of you is on personalized medicine in psoriasis with a focus on stratification and biomarkers. And in the faculty, uh, beside myself, we, I'm, uh, have two colleagues, Claudio Fiocci and Catherine Smith, who's also going to give a presentation. And uh, after that, we have a Q&A. So, before we start the presentations for this webinar, I would let you know that, that at the bottom or on your screen, you should see a Q&A button. And if you have questions, please type them in this Q&A uh, field, then we can read it and we will try to address as many questions as possible uh, during the, the, the program that, that we have today. So type in any type of questions it's impossible to have comments, but type it in and then we'll discuss it at the end of, of the webinar. The first presentation is actually given by myself and uh, I'll try to address why we need to stratify in treatment of psoriasis. And I'll do it at a top level, high level, because it should serve as an introduction to this entire global webinar series uh, trying to explain to you the different topics that we are addressing in this series. Uh, so before I start my presentation, I should let you know that these are my disclosures. I don't think they should influence at all what I'm saying today, but these are my disclosures. So why do we need to stratify in treatment of psoriasis? When we go to meetings, when we discuss with colleagues, and we are, I think most of the participants that are here today are all considered psoriasis experts or have a special interest in psoriasis. So you probably take part in this discussion that is ongoing at all our events. We discuss how we can conduct personalized medicine, how we can enhance patient centricity. We also use the term individualized treatment and we discuss precision medicine. These are kind of buzzwords in the field of psoriasis, uh, but it's extremely difficult. And I think we all agree on that. In fact, I think for many of us, uh, it's, we use a treatment algorithm, a so-called step-up treatment approach when we treat our psoriasis patient. It must of course be modified from different parts of the, of, of the world and also from clinic to clinic, but in broad terms, I think we can say that, that for most patients, we start with a topical treatment. That can be a steroid or, or calcipotriol or, or other topical treatments available in the specific area. And if this topical treatment fails to control the disease, we often advance to UV treatment. That can be broadband or narrowband UVB. And there are other topical treatments that may be used in different clinical settings that includes TARS or climate therapy. But if we cannot control the disease, if we cannot control the patient with, with topical treatment, 
we move to systemic treatment and we have the older systemic uh, small molecules, including methotrexate, acetylene, cyclosporine, and recently we have also had some more novel uh, molecules like PDE4 inhibitors and dimethyl fumarate, depending again on where in the world you practice. And again, if we cannot control the disease with the small molecule, we sometimes advance to biologic agents. But this is the traditional step-up treatment approach that we are using. And this is certainly not personalized medicine. This is not an individualized approach. We tend to think of psoriasis as psoriasis as one disease. And you are all experts. You see a lot of psoriasis patients. So I'm not going to, to educate or try to educate anyone on what psoriasis looks like. But I think these pictures is what we see on a daily basis if we see psoriasis patients. Patients with used with the psoriasis vulgaris, classic plaque type psoriasis. It can vary, some may, might be more inflammatory, some might be more scaling, but we tend to think of it like psoriasis, although there might be huge differences from one patient to another. But psoriasis can also have other faces. We can see Gotte type psoriasis, we have psoriasis patient with severe affection of the scalp, others without any affection of the scalp. Facial involvement is seen in some patient, but rarely in adult actually, but in some patient they have facial involvement. How should that be addressed? Is that a subtype of psoriasis or, or how do we, do we stratify these patients? For now, we don't have the, 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 the tools available to do that. We see patients with palmoplantar psoriasis, again, we can describe it, but we do not really know how to use this type of information. The same accounts for intertritinous or inverse psoriasis or the Kuchner phenomenon, like this patient of mine who got psoriasis in his tattoo due to the traumatization when he got the, uh, his tattoo. So, so that, that's also psoriasis, but other faces, so to say, of, of the disease. We all know of, of nail psoriasis. We know of psoriatic arthritis. Again, it's part of the clinical spectrum of psoriasis and we can describe it, but how do we use it in our daily practice? How do we stratify the patient according to these clinical differences? And how does that affect our decision on how to approach the patient and how to treat the patient? We don't really have the tools available yet. The age of onset varies. We see children with psoriasis and we also know that there are uh, patient having their first appearance of psoriasis while they are 40 years old or even older. So psoriasis is so different, although we tend to talk about psoriasis as one disease. But is psoriasis only one disease or should we try to, to address it more differently? Maybe uh, take another uh, treatment strategy when we approach these patients. This is something that we are going to address in this webinar, but also in some of the subsequent webinars. We're going to talk about uh, immunology in webinar number three and related to the immunology, we are also going to address whether early intervention, treating early on, maybe in children, treating more aggressive, if that could change the, the disease course or modify the disease course at least. We don't know that yet, but this is, some of the questions that we will have to address in the future, and that will be discussed in webinar number three. We also know, again, coming back to the stratification, we know that there are susceptibility genes for psoriasis, and there are experts maybe participating in this meeting that knows much more about the genetics than, than I do, but there are more than 80 genetic loci that have been identified, and we know that some of them predisposed to cutaneous psoriasis, some of them predisposed to psoriatic arthritis, and some of them are shared genes predisposing to both psoriatic arthritis and cutaneous psoriasis. We can identify these single SNPs, these single genes, but it becomes even more complex if you have a patient that may host a number of different susceptibility genes. So again, one psoriasis patient is not necessarily the same. Some of them may have various combination of susceptibility genes that should lead to different uh, phenotypes, different clinical presentations of the disease. 
and therefore also the way we treat and approach these patients. We know that lifestyle factors influence, we know smoking, excessive alcohol intake, sleep disturbances and obesity can worsen psoriasis. And based on studies from, from animal studies and lab studies, we also know some of the potential mechanisms behind. But having this knowledge does not necessarily lead to a change in our behavior to the patient and the way we, we, we treat the patients because it's so difficult for us to integrate this knowledge uh, when we have to, to uh, stratify or subsequent our, our patient in, in, in smaller groups to, to gain a more appropriate approach to them. Besides that, we know that comorbidities, associated diseases as like someone called them are so well described to psoriasis. We know that obesity, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease is seen more frequently in psoriasis patients. We know that they are predisposed to have inflammatory bowel diseases, arthritis, cardiovascular diseases, diabetes. All these types of associated diseases or comorbidities are seen in some patients, but not all patients. And how do we capture this? This is actually extremely difficult. So we do not necessarily use it to stratify the patients in, a pro in a, an appropriate way. And this is also addressed in this uh, webinar number three, where we also have discussions on the immunology behind some of the comorbidities and how that associate and link to psoriasis. So this is something that we have to take into consideration uh, as well. And it's extremely difficult because we do treat these patients within our sub-specialities. So we as dermatologists tend to look at the patient's skin symptoms, but we do not necessarily always capture all the other aspects of the disease. If they have inflammatory bowel disease, we sometimes refer them to a gastroenterologist. And if they have joint involvement, we refer them to a rheumatologist. And if they have other comorbidities, we refer them to other subspecialities but we do not always integrate all this knowledge in our approach to the patient. And this siloed approach sometimes leads to a lack of patient centricity. And this is something that we also, I believe, have to work with in the future, in our future organization of the way we approach the patient. And that is actually what we are going to discuss in webinar number four of this uh, webinar series, where we're going to discuss how we believe that uh, we should organize psoriasis clinics also in the future. I don't think anyone has the true solution of that, but this is an important discussion as well. It's all important because we also have to choose the right treatment for these patients. And this was actually a, 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 a paper that was published by Catherine Smith and co-workers last year. And Catherine and uh, her colleagues looked, made a system, systematic review of the biologics and they could see that if they looked only on the tolerability and the efficacy, there was differences between the available biologics that we have for psoriasis. And if we based on that and looking at that, we should imagine that we should use Rizankishumab, Guselcomab that is up here in the upper right corner because they have the highest efficacy and the best tolerability. But on the other hand, this is when we look at the skin, what is known in the literature from the skin, but we also know from what I've shown you, all the other aspects of this complex disease should be integrated. And we also, I think, all agree that there's not one single drug that, that can solve all the problems for these patients. So it's not enough. It's of course important to know about efficacy and tolerability, but this is not the entire explanation. We actually made a, a recent publication also uh, from, from my group in, in Aarhus, where we looked at uh, what we could learn from the literature when we should choose the right drug for a, a number of different autoimmune diseases, including psoriasis, psoriatic arthritis, but also inflammatory bubble diseases and uveitis. And we looked at the literature and looked at the registered biologics that were uh, and small molecules that were available for these diagnoses and looked at whether they had been approved by the EMA or FDA, whether they had reached the primary endpoint in at least a phase two study, 
and so and so on. I'm not going to go through this, but this was trying to capture if you have a patient with psoriasis that has also joint involvement or inflammatory bowel diseases, you could use a scheme like this. But again, this is not individualized. This is still at a high level, we can use this kind of information. So trying to gain it on a patient level is extremely difficult. And this is exactly what we are going to address in this webinar series. How, how, what kind of information we have available and how do we integrate that into to getting a global picture of one patient. And this is an enormous amount of, of information. And this is also the reason why the next webinar, the webinar number two that will be held in October, will focus on how to handle big data and also the question whether we can use artificial intelligence in our approach to combining all these different types of information that we are uh, gaining uh, from our uh, 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 investigation of the patients. So this is the reason why we need to stratify and, and the approaches that we, we have to take into the future, but we don't know, we don't have the solution yet. I hope we can have a good discussion today with two of our experts who's going to present next. And then with your questions, we can hopefully get as slightly closer to, to this question. It cannot be solved, it's so complex, but this is a discussion that we have to start and we hope to start it with this webinar series. So with this, I will end my presentation and I will hand over to um, Catherine Smith. And Catherine, while you are loading your uh, presentation, uh, I've just briefly introduced you. I think Catherine is uh, very well known to many of us, but Catherine is a professor in dermatology and therapeutics and consultant dermatologist at St. John's Institute and King's College in London and Guy's and St. Thomas Hospital. And you have uh, had a lot of achievements, Catherine, but I know you have a huge interest in various aspects of psoriasis and how to bring it to the patient, how to bring it to the clinic. So please, Catherine. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lars, and, and thank you to the IPC for asking me um, to talk on this biomarkers for practical use in 2021. I mean, this could be a very short talk. There are no biomarkers that have been uh, approved by the EMA or FDA for use in psoriasis. But if one extends beyond what's uh, licensed and approved, it's actually quite a broad topic. So I'm going to just focus on a few kind of key points and principles really cover off def definition and conceptual framework. Uh, biomarkers that we're already using in our routine clinical practice or perhaps could be using better. And then the discovery um, pipeline that's coming through and, and some really exciting research collaborative efforts that I think will really catalyze um, the process of bringing um, discovery science uh, to patients, which in the biomarker field and as alluded to by Lars is, is really uh, challenging. So a biomarker is actually just an abbreviation of biological marker. This is a fairly widely used definition, a characteristic that you're objectively measuring um, uh, to evaluate an indicator of a process um, or response to an exposure or intervention and particularly and typically uh, a drug intervention. And of course, the type of biomarker extends from those that we use in the clinic every day, temperature, blood pressure, uh, imaging, um, through to molecular uh, biomarkers, genetic, transcriptomic, um, proteomic as examples. Um, and more recently, this idea of digital biomarkers, um, whereby you're encompassing data captured on electronic devices, um, measuring physiological or pathological processes, elevated heart rate, often combined with clinical parameters to predict some outcome of interest. And one feature of biomarker research and probably the solution to trying to find things that are useful is to have multiple parameters uh, integrated and as Lars says AI may help us to um, improve the accuracy and discrimination discriminatory power of um, biomarkers. One important kind of principle of biomarker uh, research particularly in 
the modern day is is that the the the, the discovery programs are based on the the principle that by understanding the molecular processes and determinants of the particular uh, process that you're interested in um, by understanding that um, you will identify then biomarkers that you can use to track that particular process and so that is those biomarkers are considered direct biomarkers or perfect biomarkers in other words many uh, it, many of the biomarkers that we have are so-called imperfect or indirect they measure um, some uh, proxy or uh, related pathway and therefore they're subject to variance and influence from many factors over and above the one that you're interested in tracking. The terminology in this field is very confusing, I, I find, but this glossary um, produced by a working group uh, between the FDA and the NIH and um, has produced a very helpful uh, glossary, which also talks about um, the, the purposes of biomarkers. And um, it's been integrated now into the regulatory process, but essentially going from identifying those um, in the healthy population who are susceptible or at risk of developing a particular disease state. So here it would be psoriasis, um, diagnostic biomarkers, uh, prognostic, in other words, identifying um, uh, uh, individuals at risk of um, either disease relapse or disease progression, so progression to more severe psoriasis or progression to comorbidities, uh, predictive biomarkers, those that can identify those that are going to respond positively or negatively to a particular intervention, typically a drug, drug uh, safety biomarkers, and then surrogate biomarkers and, and this is useful in trials where you have a surrogate that is very closely related to a clinical efficacy or eff effectiveness um, outcome but might enable you to do a shorter duration of a trial so um, HIV is the perfect example as in viral load being a, a good surrogate endpoint. So in clinical practice in psoriasis we have a whole plethora of uh, clinical biomarkers that we use. So weight is really an exemplar. In this current categorization, weight is a susceptibility uh, biomarker. We know that it's causally related to obesity and also uh, quantitatively rate related. So the more weight you gain, the more your risk. It's also associated with more severe disease. So a prognostic biomarker, although the evidence for that is less secure but it is also a predictive biomarker. And this is well evidenced, including in um, work we did in our um, UK uh, pharmacovigilance registry, where we showed that you're half as likely to respond to a biologic therapy at a weight, as an example, of greater than 110 um, kg. So this is um, a biomarker that you can use already to um, personalize your therapy. And indeed that it's a predictive and on the causal pathway. So obesity increases the clearance of biologic drugs, and that's probably at least one of the mechanisms whereby there's a poorer uh, response. We all use, or perhaps should, as Lars was intimating, um, screening tools and algorithms to identify uh, those at risk of these um, problematic comorbidities. And uh, these are now um, integrated as high, um, good clinical practice in evidence-based guidelines um, published in, um, by the AAD and MPF and also in our uh, NICE UK guidelines um, with all the literature and evidence underpinning that. I mean, many of the algorithms aren't necessarily validated in psoriasis, but nevertheless, um, they're very useful tools that we should probably all be using in, in a more sort of systematic way in our, in our populations. And we're all using uh, screening and monitoring schedules for monitoring safety biomarkers, so-called um, toxicity uh, of standard systemics and other therapies. Uh, drug level monitoring or therapeutic drug monitoring is a, a, a is a particular interest in me and uh, of mine and in fact been um, the um, IBD community have really led on this uh, and it's um, standard of care in many departments to measure um, drug levels and this um, relies on the on the principle that there's a relationship between the dose of the drug you give so that's the intervention uh, and the outcome uh, response and um, 
the drug level, which in this setting is the biomarker, is both a monitoring biomarker if you use it in patients who are relapsing, uh, but it's also evidenced by um, for use as a predictive biomarker. So um, the therapeutic range for, as an example, adalimumab is, it has been um, shown in uh, independent observational cohorts, both from the UK and um, from Phyllis' school um, group in Amsterdam. And we know also that those therapeutic ranges um, uh, correlate in other immune-mediated uh, disease. And as I said, this therapeutic range also relates to its use as a predictive biomarker. So in other words, if your drug level um, is in within that, that will also tell you what the disease status is likely to be in um, six months' time. And so in some areas, there is certainly a lot of use in uh, non-responders. So if somebody's relapsing, then this is so-called non-responder reactive testing for anti-drug antibodies or low drug levels. But there is... Um, you know, reasonable evidence also to suggest that more proactive testing could help um, identify those patients either who have rather low levels and before they clinically relapse so that you can either increase the dose or switch uh, or have rather high levels. And in RA, um, dose tapering has been shown to be effective and um, cost effective. And we've now introduced this into our routine clinical care um, in um, our, our clinic. What are the emergent biomarkers and the development pipeline? Um, well, as Alars alluded to, the um, genetics uh, susceptibility to psoriasis is uh, well described. And this idea, um, which is seen in many diseases of um, developing a genetic risk score, so to pull all the um, susceptibility um, together, uh, to see whether or not you can use that score to discriminate those who have or have not got a condition or disease. And this was done um, by Soya et al. Um, and showing here on the left, this is a, a, a rock curve essentially with a good what's called area under the curve. This is a this is this is would be considered a, a good test in terms of discriminating between those who have or have not got are likely to get psoriasis. But of course, probably what we're more interested in if we were going to in, in, in introduce this at a population level is understanding who's going to get more severe disease um, or who's going to go on and get complex disease uh, and it may be that adding in additional parameters for example weight might better um, um, identify that group um, in terms of diagnostics and that idea of subtyping psoriasis, uh, not on a clinical phenotype, but on a molecular phenotype. This is, of course, well um, documented or proof of concept in pustular, generalized pustular psoriasis, where we know that the R36 pathway is, is dominant, um, evidenced um, by the um, efficacy of the R36 uh, blockade. But in plaque psoriasis, we really aren't um, getting at the molecular phenotype. Uh, subtypes. However, HLA-C0602 may be a candidate that's hinting at some stratifier because it is associated, we know that this is a, the major genetic determinant of psoriasis by a very long way, but it's also associated with a particular clinical phenotype. And interestingly, um, we looked at this as a, a discriminator uh, for treatment response and treatment selection. So we already know that HLAC 0602, you get um, improved, um, it can, it, positivity uh, increases the chance of response to bustakinumab. But we asked the question in this um, study whether it could help uh, discriminate well or decide your selection, should you go for a TNF antagonist or ustekinumab? And interestingly, what we did find was that the proportion, if you if you look here, you've got responders, uh, you've got the adalimumab cohort and the ustekinumab, and the chances um, if you're HLA-CO602 negative of responding um, to adalimumab, they were much greater than of responding to ustekinumab. And this um, discriminatory power um, or stratifier, this difference was much more uh, obvious in those who also had psoriatic arthritis. So the suggestion is that perhaps um, HLA positive and negative disease are distinct uh, subtypes that could help us um, 
decide what sort of pathway we should be blocking in, in, in terms of uh, treatment response. Thinking about just the pathway for biomarker development, perhaps one of the reasons it's been so slow because for the last 20 years we've been looking at it, it, it it's a complicated um, process and also we have to demonstrate that it's better than the standard of care but it typically starts with analysis of a large number of samples and then um, uh, uh, a large uh, large number of analytes um, in a small number of patients moving towards um, then uh, demonstration of validity in a larger number of, of patients and this all takes time but work that um, we did as part of the sort consortium illustrates this pathway quite nicely. Uh, Paola Meglio led on this um, work, but essentially um, based that the approach was based on that premise that by identifying um, uh, determinants of uh, drug response in that pathway, you could, if you looked at it carefully, um, you could identify a biomarker. And so um, in this, we, we, we took um, a small number of patients, 16, uh, but looked in detail at the circulating peripheral uh, blood um, mononucleus. Uh, we were interested in blood, obviously, as a scalable um, uh, uh, vehicle, and looking at seven major immune subsets and deeply phenotyped them, and at the same time, um, looked at NF-kappa-B signaling, which is the major signaling event following um, TNF ligation. And what, we, what, what was found was um, that pre-treatment in that, um, the dendritic cells showed enhanced NF-kappa-B signaling in those who did not respond to adalimumab. And then this went on to validate in a second cohort um, using a different technique in frozen rather than fresh PBMCs for scalability, uh, refined and looked at the mechanism and also demonstrated that yes, indeed, in adalimumab non-responders in skin, there were more, um, more of them and more mature dendritic cells and then went on uh, to validate this in, in a, a further um, independent cohort, um, arriving at what looks like, and it is very small numbers, a sensitivity of 100% and specificity of around 90%. So this is potentially what we would call a very promising biomarker, but it's only at the very beginning of the biomarker pipeline because we need to scale this up, uh, show clinical validity, maybe show clinical validity in other populations using adalimumab in order for it to be realistic to introduce it into the clinic. And we know in the area of biomarker research, as Lars mentioned at the beginning, we've just done this um, very large review and out of um, 186 studies, really um, there were no biomarkers there with um, established clinical utility they're all at the discovery or qualification um, stage. And actually there were, was a lot of research redundancy in what we found and methodological flaws that, that would be important to address in future studies. And so one of the really uh, positive things that is happening in the psoriasis um, landscape is these major um, collaborative uh, efforts. So uh, to discover clinically useful biomarkers. So biomap, biomap is one. This is particularly concerned with psoriasis and, and eczema with the idea of curating and harmonizing all the data sets already there with a view to working together. Hippocrates is another looking at development um, and biomarkers of development towards psoriatic arthritis. And there are others, the Skin Science Foundation is another effort to curate and um, harmonize and collaborate. So um, just in, in summary, the, the opportunity is huge, but it's a complicated, challenging area. We're already used to using biomarkers in our clinical practice. We could probably use them more systematically and more proactively. Um, there are a limited number of promising biomarkers at the moment, but on a positive note, the regulatory framework and pipeline for the development is, is now well established. And these large scale collective uh, re collaborative research effort, uh, efforts really do promise um, opportunity, I think, for expediting delivery of biomarkers to our, our clinical practice. So this is just a slide summarizing um, people I work with. Thank you to all of them. There's too many to mention and, um, and um, also very happy to answer questions. Um, that was a brief 
a brief talk. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Catherine, uh, for this very nice uh, overview and nice presentation. As mentioned in the beginning, we will take all the presentation and then we'll have the discussion uh, at the end of, of the session. Uh, I could uh, mention again that if you have questions, you can, I see some has used the chat box, you can also use the Q&A uh, box at the, uh, at the bottom of your screen. Uh, but again, before we take the question, we'll take the last presentation. It's going to be given by Claudio Fiocci. And uh, Dr. Fiocci may not be as well known to all of us because uh, Dr. Fiocci is, uh, obtained his medical degree from Santa Casa Faculty of Medicine in Sao Paulo in Brazil and followed by training in internal medicine, immunology and gastroenterology in Sao Paulo, Baltimore and Cleveland. And currently, uh, Dr. Fiostro is professor in molecular medicine at the Cleveland Lena College of uh, Medicine uh, and a staff member of the Department of Inflammation and Immunity in the Learner Research Institute of Cleveland. Uh, he's a gastroenterologist and he has a long, lifelong research interest in the pathogenesis of inflammatory bowel diseases. And more recently, he's also uh, had an, an interest in areas uh, of how to use system biology and network medicine uh, to understand IBD pathogenesis in a more comprehensive fashion. So we hope we can, we as dermatologists can learn from what you're doing in gastroenterology. So uh, please, Claudio. Thank you. I'm going to share my screen. Okay, can you see my screen? Yeah, it's fine. Thank you. So first of all, I want to thank the opportunity of sharing uh, our knowledge and our tribulations uh, in IBD with the colleagues uh, in psoriasis. There are many similarities between the two conditions. Both are complex and there are many differences. So, um, uh, these are the factors that we believe are involved in uh, the etiopathogenesis of inflammatory bowel disease, which of course I mentioned together, Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. And uh, you know, the environment, uh, the genes, the immune system, the microbiota are the main factors, but probably many more. Each one of them is very complex. And obviously I'm not gonna go into uh, the details, but the big difference with psoriasis, there is a major input of the microbiota as most of the microbes in our bodies are in the gut, particularly in the colon. And these four elements must come together to cause the disease. I will present uh, something about biomarkers, but mostly a, an overview of where we stand there, how we approach the, the disease and the therapy and the biomarker formation. So if we look at therapy of inflammatory bowel disease, Obviously, one says, if well, if there are four components of pathogenesis, you know, those are the target for intervention. So what happens if we do that? Well, first of all, we don't have any genetic therapy for inflammatory bowel disease. In inflammatory bowel disease, we have over 240 genetic associations. But even if we're ab able to modulate, or if you will correct all the SNPs, this will not cure the patients simply because genes alone do not cause the disease. If we try to intervene in the environmental level with diet, smoke cessation, or lifestyle modifications, this will represent at most 5% of what we do in practice. And people, patients don't like to lifestyle modification. If I have a Crohn disease patient that gets worse because they smoke, they seldom start smoking. If we intervene at the microbial level with diet, antibiotics, probiotics, and fecal transplants, we're intervening in about 10% of the times in clinical practice. So what we do in reality is basically trying to modulate the immune system. And here we have an endless number of medications. So this leads us to the conclusion that chronic autoimmune inflammatory diseases or immune mediated inflammatory diseases like IBD, like psoriasis, rheumatoid arthritis, atomic dermatitis, and so on, they're all inflammatory diseases. And I think it's good to stop 
from time to time and take a step back when we consider the problem that we're facing. When we talk about treatment of these conditions, uh, what are we doing? What are we treating? Are we treating the disease as a whole or are we treating the inflammation? Inflammation is not the disease. Inflammation is the manifestation of the disease, is the mechanism of the disease. If you go back 20 years ago, Carl Nathan, which is or was one of the great leaders in inflammation, make a very interesting statement. When primary pathogenic events are unknown, control of inflammation is sometimes the best option. And this is what we've been doing for the last decades, at least two decades, if not more. And that's where still the focus is on trying to control and treat immune-mediated inflammatory diseases. Now, if we look at how good the treatments are in place in inflammatory bowel disease, the most advanced immunological therapy for media are far from optimal. These are four studies with adalimumab, infliximab, bedolizumab, eustachinumab. If you look at what happens to the patient at the end of a year of treatment, look at the response, 25%, 17%, 18%, 36%, which I, I must say are not as good as the one we see in psoriasis which means that you know, while what we do primarily in clinical practice does induce a response, can induce remission, but this doesn't last, doesn't last for a long time and the patient has to be treated in a different way. We recently published a review in Lancet Gastroenterology Pathology when we, and the title on that review was also really colitis therapeutic ceiling. If we look at all these studies, and all these therapies. And if we look at the differential response between the therapy arm and placebo arm, we go from as low to 7% to a top of 28%. So obviously it's clear that if we don't do anything in some of the patients, they will get better anyway. So our ability to intervene really meaningfully and significantly for at the patient level, you know, is not very good at all in IBD. And then I look at some of the stuff that goes on in psoriasis. And I look at the, the papers in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2012, where it was in Ixaxinumab, Pervalimumab, and so on. In 2012, there was a, you know, a therapeutic responses in the range of 80%, 75, 80%, which are very envious as a gastroenterologist. And then we look at the recent paper in Lancet and the, the two that came out just this week in the New England Journal of Medicine, we are basically at the same level of response, which means that yes, we can modify the intervention, at least the biological intervention. And we have just tiny incremental improvement, but we're not really treating the disease. We're not curing the disease. And I agree in this paper by Griffith at all, the cure for psoriasis unlikely to be delivered in the near future. And I could say the cure for IBD, it's unlikely to be delivered in the near future. So how easy or difficult is to treat patients with imids? How good are the drugs that are on the market in general? This is a very interesting paper published not in dermatology or IBD journals, but in biostatistics. When they look at the probability of success, POS, of new drugs in real world use. In a period of 10 years from 2005 to 2015, after going through phase one and two to two, three and approval, when the drug go, all drugs go on the real market, when it prescribed, the, the success or probability of success is as low as 5% as high as 14%. So in general, we don't do very well in treating almost anything. So if we're not very good at what we do now, why don't we think about changing what we do now? How can we enhance the probability of success for drugs? And I think the answer is to targeting networks instead of single molecules, which is what we've been doing for the last half a century. We all agree that Immune-mediated inflammatory diseases like psoriasis, IBD, rheumatoid, and so on, are complex diseases. They have multiple components. All the components act in a network. And I think we should think in terms of disease network and apply what's called network medicine using artificial intelligence. 
this is a book they strongly recommend to be read by anybody that deals with chronic inflammatory diseases. It's a way to conceptualize the disease in a different way and get away from the single molecule, single target approach that we know is not optimal. So let's talk about artificial intelligence. This will be addressed in the next seminar in a very simplistic fashion. Let's give an example that everybody is familiar with. This is a computer network. The computer network works because there is a central controller, what we call a, con a hub, the network controller. If I eliminate the, the central controller, all the network is disabled. There is no network. A disease is a biological network. There are many components, many factors, but there is something that control the network the disease controller. If I eliminate that, there is no network, there is no disease. So based on this approach, what do we do to really go to the next step for therapy and biomarker development? Well, let's look at the IBD network as an example. This is a network with the component that I mentioned before, the genes, the environment, the microbes, immune, and others all are interconnected and they all influence each other. But there are people, people, what we call nodes that are more important. And at the center of what we call the disease module, there is a hub, the disease controller. So if we intervene on a network and we give the patient analgesic, this will have no effect because it's acting at the peripheral of the network. If I intervene with an antibiotic, I will have some effect because microbes are involved in the network, but the effect will be limited because it again is in the peripheral of the network. Same thing if I intervene with immunosuppressor, JAK inhibitor, I will have some effect because they're modulating the immune system. If I intervene with the biologic, which affect both the, the immune system, but also more centrally located nodes, I will have some effect. But the best effect, will be obtained if we intervene on the boss, the hub, the controller of the network. As I showed you before, if we eliminate the controller, we eliminate the network. So if we develop hub-specific compounds, then what happens is that there is no hub, no network, and no inflammatory bowel disease. And this applies to no psoriasis, no rheumatoid arthritis and so on. So how do we do that? That is not very simple. And we as primarily clinicians are not very smart or we're not trained to think in this way. I certainly don't have the tools to develop these approaches. So if I may, let me give you a, an, an allegory, a metaphor of what, how I see the problem. Here we have a, a mountain which I call the impenetrable amid cliff. That's where the answers are, but it's very hard to climb it and go to the top. And on a cliff, there is a clinician, myself. And on the other cliff, there is a scientist. And the clinician says, I'm a real expert in amid, but I know nothing about artificial intelligence. Can you help me? And the scientist will say, I know nothing about emits." but I'm a real expert in artificial intelligence. How can I help you? This is to indicate that we need to collaborate with people that provide us tools that we don't know how to use and we don't have expertise in it. I was fortunate enough to interact with a very smart young investigator that has exactly this approach. And I will give an example of what we're doing in inflammatory bowel disease to develop the next generation of IBD therapeutics. The concept is to target the whole disease interactome all at once, all together, not just the immune components as we tend to do most of the time. We want to identify targets in specific IBD subsets. And here is the concept that Dr. Iverson mentioned that not the patients are classified by clinicians, by us, as having this or having that, but that's a very superficial and crude classification because at the molecular level, there's a great diversity. 
So we have to use molecular tools to do that. And this is done by computational artificial intelligence for drug design and optimization. This is fairly complex, but what we do basically is this. We use patient biosamples to identify the hub, the gene targets. Here is a bunch of IBD patients. Some have active disease, some have inactive disease, and these are controlled subjects. And in IBD, we are fortunate that we obtain stools that don't cost anything. We can do biopsies on a routine basis, and we obtain blood samples. And with these, we can do a number of analysis of ohms, like identification, molecular identification of the epigenome, the transcriptome, the cytokinome, microbiome, and other ohms. And the ohms are or have to be choose based on the question that is asked. Once a molecular network are identified, they are integrated by a machine learning process to identify the BD molecular subtype. And this is fundamentally important because each subgroup of patient will have a different molecular subtype and each one of them will have a different hub. And this is critical because it tells us that each subgroup of patient has a different hub, which means has a different target, which means we need different medications. So what happens is this, we do the analysis. When we combine this, we get an IBD network, but this IBD network will be different. If we do a number of patients, all, each one of them will fall into different networks. At this level, they may look like IBD, Crohn's or colitis, but you can see that some will have red arrows and we have a disease network subgroup A. Some others in blue will have the IBD network subgroup B and the one in green, we have the IBD network subgroup C. Once we have the molecular grouping, this automatically allows to have biomarker discovered in each one of these groups, not the biomarker that identifies these patients, biomarkers that identifies these groups, this group, and this group. And this allowed the intervention in a very specific way, what we call precision therapy. The steps to do that are fairly laborious and complicated, and I'm not going to in, in spend too much time in it, but there is a series of steps like developing vitro models, biopsy model from the patients. We are fortunate to easily biopsy the gut, we do experimental colitis animal models, two or three models. Then we check for bioavailability, toxicity assays, and then we look at signature of response at the molecular and microbial levels. And uh, for some of the patients that we studied, we developed drugs that can restore intestinal permeability at the same time that induce Treg activation. This is not something that happens in all the patients that we have studied. This is something that so far for a particular lead compound that has been recently identified. This for in a subgroup of ulcerative colitis patients, only 33% of UC patients will benefit from the therapy addressing using this lead compound, which means that the, su the subclassification by molecular phenotype is absolutely essential if we want really improve therapy. This allows also the development of blood and stool biomarkers. And that we already have developed a biomarker for the 33% of the UC patients that have a particular molecular subtype. So the way that we are now, it's a, a way what I call a transition phase. What we're doing, what we've done from the two, 1940, when the therapy with sulfasalazine started in ulcerative colitis until last year, 2020, and obviously these data are flexible. Well, we have a mixed IBD populations. This could be IBD patients, psoriasis patients, MS patients, whatever. And then the patients go to the doctor. The doctor does medical, using medical tools, does clinical profiling, history, physical examination, blood, serology, stools, imaging, endoscopy, biopsy. And some type of information is gathered but this information is processed by a human being, the doctor, that has variable knowledge and variable experience. 
And the doctor does a diagnosis and a classification. And based on phenotypically homogeneous group, the patients look the same, there is subclassification in various groups, A, B, and C, and many more. And why is this done? Because the, all the A patients are smiling, all the B patients are serious, and all the C patients are sad. But at the same time, each group is a different color. These are different patients, but all end up receiving non-specific anti-inflammatory therapy. And that's why we fail in providing better care for our patients. I believe that in this decade, 2020 to 2030, we're gonna transition into more, far more specific therapies that are based on far more objective analysis of the patients. Rather than use medical tools and do clinical profiling, we're gonna do use molecular tools, biosample derived omics profiling with all biosamples. And by doing exposome, genome, epigenome, transcriptome, whatever ohm you want, combined with electronic medical records, and this is very important, then we can identify the imid interactome groups, the individual subnetworks of all these patients. And the beauty about this process, this is a totally unbiased process. There is no human intervention except for the utilization of the machine learning, machine teaching process. But there is no subjective decision by the physician or what, where the patient fits. When we do the molecular subgrouping, we identify molecular homogeneous amid the amid groups. All the patients are pink, yellow, blue, green, or gray, regardless of what we did here. And these patients are molecularly homogeneous, and each one of these patients will receive very specific medication that targets the hub that control the disease network in each one of the diseases. So we are in a very important transition phase, which will really will make difference. The track obviously is one to convince the, our communities that this approach will change the way we work. We need also acquire some tools of knowledge, not necessarily that we can implement machine learning approaches because that requires long training, a different type of expertise, which is not part of medical training, but collaborate with people can provide this expertise and collaborate between physicians and scientists and develop approach which are unbiased and look at molecular classifications. I hope that this was clear and I thank you all of you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Fiocci, for this very nice and, and interesting and in inspiring presentation, which I really think is spot on. We, we were aiming for a discussion on what was going to happen in the next five years, but from your presentation, probably it has even longer perspectives, but, but there's something that's going to happen in the, in the next decade. Absolutely. We are running a little bit short in time, but we have a few questions, and I think we should spend just a few minutes on, on some of them. There's one for you, Dr. Fiocci, uh, from Mark, he says it's a very interesting presentation. He mentioned the molecular phenotype of an individual patient is probably very uh, labile depending on the disease activity. And I guess that the hub has the same uh, lability. How, how can you handle this? Could you comment on that? So the molecular phenotype, it's one that determines the disease. But as the disease become chronic, like all these diseases, the molecular phenotype may change. So we have to also do longitudinal follow-up of these patients because the drug that, that uh, intervene in a hub when the disease is triggered may not be the same hub that you know, is controlling the disease 10 or 15 years later. We don't know this information. And so the complication goes not only at the diagnostic level, but at the follow-up level. And nobody is doing these studies. In our field, unfortunately, what is missing are longitudinal studies. Thank you. Uh, and, and from a more practical level, uh, Catherine, there's another question for you. There, there's one saying that you mentioned uh, therapeutic drug monitoring as a, as a monitoring and predictive biomarker. 
However, in psoriasis, implementation of, of this uh, in clinical practice is still lacking behind in comparison with rheumatology. How do you think that this needs to be tackled? Uh, of course, it varies from country to country how much you use it, but, but do you have any comments to that and how, how that should be in, included maybe? Yeah, I mean, well, I think one thing is that, of course, adalimumab and the TNF antagonists are not the most effective drugs we've got. So as Wayne Gulliver has been making a comment that the only biomarker you need for treatment response is a plaque of psoriasis, which is, you know, <laughs> true. We do have fantastically effective drugs. but So I think that may have influenced it. But, you know, adalimumab is incredibly cheap now. Um, and it's a very simple test and the actual measurement of serum drug levels is, is very simple. But I think it speaks to the challenge of introducing any new test to clinical practice. It's guidelines. You know, I've been I spent most of my life writing recommendations and I know that mostly or often they're not followed for. And, and I mean, it, when we introduced it into our clinic, you know, first of all, we had to validate our local our local um test to make sure it was comparable to what had been published we then had to educate the team we had to devise a protocol we had to get it approved all of these things and then we had to implement it so there's an education and training so i think all of those things are barriers to introduction of tdm but it, they're also barriers to biomarker and I, I think another comment's been made in the chat about you know the cost of it the cost effectiveness of it and so on and those are also barriers to implementation. So I think it's, um, I think we can learn from the reasons behind TDM being not taken up in, in psoriasis communities. And I think we'll take one more question. I promise that we should stay as close to, to the time as, as possible, but there's one more and actually interesting uh, question coming from India uh, saying thanks for, for excellent presentation. And as, I think that could be addressed to both of you. Uh, do you think that artificial intelligence based decision making in psoriasis patient, but it could be in, in inflammatory bowel diseases, I guess, as well. Uh, in psoriasis patients management will compromise the, the clinical skills, art of clinical skills in future generation of dermatologists. Well, do you believe that the computer will take over all diagnosing in the future? We could start with you, Claudio. So this is, this is a very common question that translate the fear of the medical community about losing the job in the future. That eventually will happen in the far distant future because machine will be much better than any humans. The bias of human nature prevents objectivity. But I don't think that the doctor from India has to be worried at this time. I think that what we need to do is to use the best of us and the best of the machine to do the best for our patients. Thank you for, 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 for keeping us all uh, safe oh. and don't, don't, not, not, not afraid of losing our job in the near future, at least. Catherine, you have a comment on that? I, I'd agree, but I'd be even more positive about the role of clinicians, you know, going forward. I mean, we all know even now there's information and facts that we know, uh, but that working with our patients and making the right decision, even when there's great certainty that an intervention or a strategy is the right thing to do, still takes the skill of, of a clinician. So I, I think that we've got, but I, I see it as, as really um, supporting and enabling things as opposed to replacing us. But, you know, <laughs> who knows? <laughs> it's a matter of time. <laughs> you might be right, yeah. I won't be around to see it, put it that way. <laughs> No, we won't. <laughs> okay, I think we are running out of time, but before we're closing this uh, first global webinar hosted by the IPC, I want to thank uh, the IPC team for helping organizing the, the, the webinar. And I also, of course, want to thank both you, Catherine and Claudio, so very much for, for two excellent presentations. And that has also been commented by many of the participants in the, the chat box that, that it was excellent uh, presentations. And of course, I also want to thank all of you participating in this event. And I certainly hope that you will uh, join for the next four global webinars and other IPC activities uh, in the meantime. And when I started out this session, I said that the vision of the IPC was a world free of psoriasis. And I would add that I have another vision and that's a world free of COVID-19. So I hope that we 
in the near future can meet not only virtually, it works perfectly uh, virtually, but I hope that we can meet also face to face and uh, maybe have more in-depth discussion on uh, face to face and maybe even share a beer or something like that. So with this, I want to thank you all. Have a nice rest of the day and stay safe. Thank you very much. Thank you.